I'm Stemily Kay, your hostess to the world of STEM, and today I'm here with Miss Leonard, who is the very first female Native American graduate of the University of Oxford. So I'm so happy that you could be with us today. Well, I'm happy to be joining you. Uh, it's a, a great pleasure and an honor to get to speak with you. So first, I just want to start with your childhood. So what if STEM influenced you at all when you were younger? What, you know, who influenced you? What were your passions? That type of thing. Well, I think um, I'll start by saying um, um, So I just introduced myself in my Shinnecock language. That's awesome. um, I said hello, and I hope that you're having a good day. Um, that my name is Kelsey Leonard, and I'm from the Shinnecock Indian Nation. Um, and our territory is located on the southern shores of Long Island in New York. Um, and that's really integral to what has shaped my STEM identity. Mm -hmm. We're a coastal nation. Um, our reservation and our territory sits uh, where freshwater meets saltwater. We're on a peninsula um, in the estuary and bay system of the Atlantic Ocean on Long Island. And so water is integral mm -hmm. to, to our identity, to our culture. And so for me, having an understanding of indigenous science and the way that that connects with, uh, with STEM has been really grounded throughout my whole upbringing. Um, I'm also a military brat. Um, my, mm -hmm. my father was in the Air Force, so I was actually born in Honolulu, Hawaii, um, so, and then moved around quite a bit, but um, I uh, lived on our, our territory and on our reservation um, in high school That's and awesome. then went off to university. So what did you end up deciding to study, and how did you find that passion uh, and stick with it? So um, I've always been a great uh, lover and supporter of Indigenous rights and, and the rights that our nations hold. Mm -hmm. And I guess I come from a bit of an activist family, if you'll call it that, um, protector family, uh, you know, really wanting to advocate for the rights of our nation and the protection of our lands and water. And so that was very much the framing of my academic choices. I think in high school, I was involved with Model United Nations. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I went on to university, I was thinking very much in the international relations, public policy realm. And, and that, in, but with an indigenous uh, studies, uh, Native American mm -hmm. studies leaning. And so that was very formative. Um, I think as well, my... My brother um, is sort of um, seen as the marine biologist, so he was kind yeah. of maybe the science influence, taking a lot of our understandings as coastal indigenous peoples mm -hmm. and people who live off the sea. Um, you know, Shinnecock in our language means people of the shore. So he was very formative in, in showing me early on that balance between science and um, an indigenous knowledge. Mm -hmm. And then my sister is, is an artist um, mm -hmm. and really does, you know, blends a lot of science and art in, in her work. And so I found myself kind of, you know, deterring off that track a bit, you know, carving my own path and going in sort of the more rights, legal framework um, uh, trajectory. And then probably my third year of university, I did a study abroad program in Samoa, and I um, really got to experience a lot of the water issues that um, – mm -hmm the nation was facing, as well as, um, you know, I'd lived, in, you know, among an, in another small island developing state called Dominica in the southern Antilles of the Caribbean and, and lived with the indigenous nation there, the Kalinago people. And they also had similar water issues, you know, lack of access to, to mm -hmm. potable water, lack of access to sanitation. And it was just so reminiscent of my home community and my home territory on Shinnecock where we do have issues with, um, with, with, with our water, with saltwater intrusion, um, with a lack of access to proper yeah. sanitation. And so by my third year of university, I was really starting to see that my um, love of international relations and international rights and the protection of indigenous rights in an international sphere could really be driven from a scientific perspective and from a water science perspective. So what... Really, who was or who or what was something that kept you going through all of this? Because um, especially, you know, 
being a female, being a Native American female, you can face a lot of challenges. So especially, you know, through university, it's hard to get through those four years sometimes, especially when you're following a passion that, you know, not many other people are right there with you to support. So how did you handle that? I think it's, you know, it's a great question and, and it's very, it's a very difficult one to answer, I think, in that, um, at least for, for me, the support network that was present at my university through the Harvard University Native American program. So I did my undergraduate um, degree at, at Harvard University and did a joint degree in sociology and anthropology with a secondary field in ethnic studies or indigenous studies at that, at that time. And... And for me, to be able to make it through that joint degree program that had somewhat of a science leaning by the time I hit my third year, it was that that support network of mm -hmm. the Native American program. The other Native American students, although we were kind of an ultra minority within the minority um, at the university, but that support network was really important to me. Um, my family, of course, um, as well as the local nations in, in the Boston area. So... Um, Harvard was actually originally founded as an Indian college, and some of the first students to graduate from Harvard um, were Wampanoag students. And for me, um, being able to connect with the local Indigenous nations that were at the university, um, get to learn from them, get to get to acknowledge um, the the breadth of their history and how it contributed to the university and to my my presence and my my current education there um, was. Mm -hmm. Um, very encouraging and, and, a, and a point of strength when times were difficult. So how did your education lead you to the careers that you've had in your life, and could you talk about what they've been? Okay. Um, so my trajectory, I would say, is I did my undergraduate, uh, undergraduate degree at Harvard University. I then, after my third year, um, refocused uh, or, or focused a bit in on my area of study uh, to be within mm -hmm. Indigenous water um, and Indigenous water rights. And I uh, completed my um, uh, uh, bachelor's program at Harvard and then went and did my master's science at the University of Oxford. And uh, that program was at the School of Geography and the Environment mm -hmm. in Water Science Policy and Management. Um, and I was fortunate, you know, after um, com completing my degree at Harvard, I spent mm -hmm. some time as a legislative um, associate with the National Congress of American mm -hmm. Indians in Washington, D.C. And through um, that program and that fellowship, I was able to study um, under uh, the legal staff and, mm -hmm. and the council there, um, just as an undergrad out of university. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was a really great opportunity for me. And I also worked on um, many of their projects related to the U.N. Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous mm -hmm. People as well as a climate change adaptation. So it was a short fellowship because I then mm -hmm. left to go to Oxford. Um, but during that time, it was about three, three or four months I was with them. It was um, very formative in understanding um, Indigenous sovereignty and, and water rights uh, within the U.S. context specifically. So I went and I um, did my master's in water science policy and management at Oxford. And my dissertation there focused on... Um, achieving the, the, trust the trust responsibility within the United States um, through the government-to-government -government relationship the United States has with federal Indian tribes to protect water resources. And, and really it was an analysis mm -hmm. of water quality standards that exist on um, Indian reservations across the United States and, and the ways in which the current structure of the Clean Water Act um, allow mm -hmm. for some greater protections of indigenous water, um, but in some ways also allows for great um, and vast loopholes um, that really disadvantage uh, indigenous nations and in, in the United States. So after that, um, I, I realized that there was such a legal bent to my, um, my study and to my uh, desire to advocate for indigenous nations and to protect their rights mm -hmm. um, as it pertains to water. And so I went to law school. I uh, focused in, in environmental law mm -hmm. um, at Duquesne University School of Law in Pittsburgh, which is a really unique space for, for me um, as a water scientist mm -hmm. and a water advocate um, or scholar activist, as I sometimes like to put it, uh, because uh, Pittsburgh is where um, it's, it's actually one of, seen as one of the most sacred places in the world um, by, by different spiritual leaders, because it's the place where three rivers meet, where the Ohio, the Allegheny, and the Monongahela meet at the point. 
uh, the Pittsburgh Point. And um, it has just a, a really rich history, a really rich water mm-hmm. history. So getting to learn the, the legal um, uh, framework in that um, environment was really beneficial to my overall um, career uh, path. Mm-hmm. And so um, I finished with my law program, and I now find myself uh, in a PhD program at uh, McMaster University mm-hmm. in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, uh, where I am the Philomathia Fellow in, in Water Policy. And my uh, research looks at the transboundary um, management of the Great Lakes and collaboration and coordination of the United States and Canada with Indigenous nations. Um, for the protection and and, ma- and preservation of, of the lakes. So, and, uh, yes, go ahead. Oh, wow. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but, um, so, you're currently pursuing your PhD. So, what are, you know, could you talk about, on a day-to-day basis, are you doing a lot of research? If so, what kind? Are you doing more, um, you know, if so, scientific research, more, um, literature-based research, you know, what does your typical schedule look like? Um, well, I will say that at this current point in my life, my typical schedule is not non-existent. Every day is different. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think a, a big part of that is although I am working on, on my own research and making sure that there um, is scientific research to support Indigenous rights and claims to the protection of water, um, I also serve with my tribal nation, so I'm a, uh, a political appointee with our nation um, for our Natural Resources Committee, mm-hmm. and I serve on behalf of our nation for the U.S. National Ocean Council uh, Mid-Atlantic Regional Planning Body, um, and I serve as the tribal co-lead for that. Um, so I find that my current work and my day-to-day schedule is very much yeah. the confluence of fresh water meets salt water, and so I... I always had hoped that I would um, be that living embodiment of, of, of my nation, um, and it's starting to, to be that. Um, you know, as I mentioned at the start of our, of our interview, um, our territory sits where freshwater meets salt, and to me, um, one of the biggest uh, crises and governance in, in our world today, globally, when it comes to water, is the way in which we um, we separate it into different categories and put it into different boxes and not um, look at water in a holistic frame. And and I think there's a lot of indigenous knowledge and science that can lend to greater policy um, implementation and initiatives that have that that holistic frame that we're missing right now. And so that's where I see my day-to-day is it's a mix of... um, a lot of conference calls and meetings, um, as well as um, doing my own uh, research and data collection, um, going in and working with Indigenous nations to, to document some of their um, uh, climate change adaptation innovations and, and how they're working to build resiliency in the Great Lakes. So what overall, you know, has been the most maybe interesting thing that you've found and also maybe the most shocking thing you found or the most difficult challenge to overcome? So I think in my work, um, I'll start with the most difficult challenge to overcome. And that's really been um, what I call often the, the politics of recognition that Indigenous peoples um, do have a long history of, of science and of scientific research and of, um, and of what I like to term Indigenous science and and how that is very much intricately woven into our, our societies and our cultures, and um, whether that be um, our cultural existence, but also our political existence. And mm-hmm. I don't think any world, any society in the world over the course of history has been able to um, exist without some level uh, of science. And, and indigenous peoples and nations are not um, absent from that. And so for me, the biggest difficulty has been translating or communicating that indigenous science is valid, should be valued, Mm -hmm. and is missing from many of the global scientific conversations that are happening in the world today. Um, I will say that's also been one of my greatest um, uh, opportunities for learning um, is is and has been the ability to communicate that indigenous science is an applied science over thousands of years. And this level of indigenous knowledge that we um, have been, as a global society, absent from connecting with and valuing 
um, it ha- has contributed to some of our greatest problems. And so that learning opportunity for me to capture that, to be able to um, offer unique opportunities where we can see a collaboration between indigenous science and what I might term Western and others have termed Western science has been um, a really pivotal path for me in carving Mm -hmm. um, what I see as a a shared sustainable future. So you're talking a lot about how science, indigenous science, is really important uh, part of these conversations that we're having in terms of policy and um, things at the United Nations and around the world uh, that you see missing. So what would you say to someone, a girl, that thinks, oh, STEM doesn't involve history or literature or political science, that if I, you know, that if I want to do those things... I can't do STEM, and if I want to do STEM, it's going to be boring, and it's not going to involve anything else, when that's just not true. (laughs) Well, I think the greatest um, lesson for me in my life has been not to listen to the naysayers. Um, Mm -hmm. I think you can carve a path for yourself that um, pulls on all of the disciplines that you want to pull from. Mm-hmm. Um, and that you have a desire to, to learn more um, about and to contribute to. So for me, that is capturing that STEM is uh, very much inclusive and needs to be even more inclusive. Mm-hmm. Of I, I like some of the um, transitioning that's happening right now to have it a STEAM, right? To have it include the, yeah. the art. Um, and, and I think that that's really important that Although we need to prioritize STEM, um, it, given that you know there are discrepancies and disparities in the specific fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics when it comes to women and girls, um, that doesn't mean that they have to take a path that is exclusively STEM. Mm-hmm. I think it means that that STEM um, can be can bolster your other interests and disciplines, or um, it can be bolstered by your other interests and passions. Um, whichever path you choose. And I think for me, um, it's been a a blend of both of those. I think in certain parts of my life and in certain projects I work on, they may be more um, STEM-centered, but have influences from other Mm -hmm. disciplines and and scholarly um, endeavors. But sometimes I have work that is maybe strictly um, what might be deemed art or strictly Mm -hmm. uh, uh, public policy work that um, I say, hey, why don't where where are the scientific voices here? Where where is science and technology and engineering and mathematics in this conversation? Because if I, from my perspective, if we work only in isolation, mm-hmm. we continue to develop these silos in our society that cause more divides than collaboration. So, what do you hope or see next? for yourself in terms of, you know, what's next after the PhD or what you would like to do? Yeah, so for me, it's always uh, been about serving my, my nation and our, and our citizenry, mm-hmm. and so to continue to do that is really important to me. Uh, p- pursuing the PhD and pursuing the academic path that I have uh, has also been to be able to conduct the research that we need to assert our inherent uh, sovereignty and, and the rights uh, that protect our political as well as cultural existence mm-hmm. in, in the modern world. And there's going to be many paths, I've found, that allow me to um, enact that in, mm-hmm. in my life. And so I've kind of taken on this um, moniker of a scholar activist where um, I really will be blending a lot of my um, legal advocacy work with my scholarship and with the, my scientific research that I'll be conducting in, um, in future years. But ultimately, all of my work, whether it be advocacy or scholarship or um, you know, bridging science, you know, different worldviews of mm-hmm. scientific philosophies, is to um, create better conversations, mm-hmm. conversations that are holistic, conversations that are inclusive and don't exclude um, any people, uh, no matter what walk of life they they come from. And I think that's a great lesson learned from Indigenous nations is we're advocating not only for for a seat at the table, 
but for others to learn from mm-hmm. our experience. You know, we're often, we often say or have been, it has been said of us that we're the miner's canary. Um, what, what happens to us will eventually happen to the rest of the mm-hmm. world. And so I see myself often as, as that miner's canary in trying to bring to light the voices that have been marginalized in so many different capacities in societies around the world, predominantly indigenous voices, but not solely. Mm-hmm. I think there's a lot of room for shared stories and, and shared lived experiences that I try and just kind of get my foot in the door yeah. and knock it open <laughs> for a few other voices and not even just a few, but hopefully many more over generations have the opportunity to to share their experience and to be heard. That's amazing. (laughs) Um, What, through all of your experience, what's some advice that you would give to girls? Well, I I think I mentioned it earlier, but I'll say it again. Um, Don't listen to people who tell you no. Mm -hmm. If you're passionate about something and you really want to to see it um, come to light, come to fruition, just pursue it, do it. Um, don't be afraid of failure either. Um, many people, some of the world's greatest minds um, over generations mm-hmm. of history um, have failed and, and that you learn from, from those experiences of failure. Um, so it's okay to, to pursue your passions, to pursue them vigilantly, even when others mm-hmm. may, uh, may tell you otherwise. Um, I think if I had listened to many of the naysayers in my life, I wouldn't be where I currently am. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's. I think I would also say to be a sponge. That was some of the best advice that I was given mm-hmm. and really took to heart. That as many opportunities as you can soak up as possible, um, per- try to pursue them. Um, and and again, don't don't let fear or the fear of failure hold you back mm-hmm. from pursuing all of those opportunities that are going to come your way and they will come in all different forms and fashions and some of them will be at university and some Mm -hmm. of them will you know be from even just the immediate knowledge of your family members and the history that they hold and and I think it's really important to to be a good listener so I think those three things don't listen to the people that tell you no don't be afraid of failure and always be a good listener I couldn't have said it better. <laughs> well, I want to thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to be with us today. And again, I'm Stemly Kay, your hostess to the world of STEM. Bye! <laughs>